Welcome to the Pat Mayo Experience Week 3 DraftKings picks and preview at every single position. We'll be breaking it all down. If you do want to check out the updated cheat sheet, as it will get updated all the way up until the 1 o'clock slate on Sunday, because this is a part of the Millionaire Maker slate, the London game is not involved, and the show will be discussing the Millionaire Maker slate only. So that's something that you should look forward to and know going into it so you're not like, where's the Monday night guys? Where's Joe Flacco? Wanted to play Joe Flacco. Not on this show. Not going to happen. Also, show some support for the show. Give us a like. I mean, don't give us a down. If you're going to give us a down thumb, like, you know, abstain from voting. But, you know, thumbs up. Always a good sign. And let's show the new, the new company. You know, you enjoy the Pat Mayo experience and you want to see some more of it. On the line today from Rotogrinders.com, host of The Morning Grind, it is CJ Colton back. The Siege. What's up? Not much, man. How are you doing? The yeah. office looks great. Uh, thank you. Listen, we're at a temporary studio right now, so we don't have the full complement of intro, graphics, set, or anything like that. Soon enough, we'll be into, like, the full Pat... So people can enjoy and get a full Pat Mayo experience. The new set is going to rule. That's why it's taken some time to build. So, you know, we had to get this up and running pretty quickly. I, I was going to introduce you as the person who loves chilies the second most of anyone on Earth, but you might actually hold that title. I think Cuss may be a pretender. I, I mean, I, I would never just besmirch anyone who likes chilies so um I, i'll let the people decide uh, who likes it more but obviously tim uh he does have some bad takes the chilies take not one of them right, listen you're no stranger to bad takes either let's not you know keep yourself out of this uh, you know absolutely not maybe it co go goes along with liking chilies then maybe that's a maybe they're correlated i mean i hate chilies too and no one produces more bad actually cuss produces more bad takes than me but i'm probably second on that list but let's get right into it running backs week three slate let's go to the very top and mr market share is number one in pricing again but he's down in price this week Le'Veon bell is eighty eight hundred dollars he's followed by kareem hunt now up to eight grand ajay seven seven melvin gordon seven six mccoy seven thousand dollars ty montgomery 69 devonta freeman 67 c mcsee music Factory, 6100 bucks. Hopefully he can run between the tackles because no one thinks that he can. And Marshawn Lynch, $6,000 at Washington in the Sunday night game, the highest projected point total of the week. For cash games, let's start off. I mean, even if you want to talk about GPPs, I, I really want to focus on Le'Veon Bell because people are kind of soured on him because he you know, really hasn't done much through two weeks. The conditioning looks like it may have caught up to him by not being in training camp and not showing up until September 1st. But this is a pretty good matchup against the Bears. Uh, he's getting 96 percent of the market share and you can't say that about any other running back in football yes he's pricey but on the road with ben who's had the struggles in terms of his stats bell generally performs pretty well on the road so do you take levy on bell here and do you expect him to be highly owned i don't expect him to be very highly owned levy on bell is going to be the guy that i'm going to take down to the wire on sunday i can already feel it like i for all the reasons you just said i want to be in but if he wasn't in shape last week and he wasn't in shape the week before, how are we sure that he's magically going to be in shape now? Like, training camp is four weeks for a reason, Pat. Like, and people like Tom Brady and Julian Edelman, they play in training camp and they risk tearing their ACL because it's important. So are we there yet with Le'Veon Bell? Is he totally right? We're also getting a discount. I'm super torn on Le'Veon Bell. I understand the reasons for playing him. I understand the reasons for fading him. I think if you ask me now, I think I would probably fade him, but it's mostly because I kind of like the value plays at running back a lot this week. All right, so when we talk about value running back, I assume you're not talking about the next three guys on the list because the way that DraftKings has done the pricing, and it's all about volume, basically. <laughs> um, so you have Hunt, you have Gordon, and you have Ajayi. Do you have a preference between one of those three? Because I think that with the way that Melvin Gordon is being used out of the backfield, his floor for receptions kind of prevents him from having any sort of, like, really dud games. Like, even when he was the super chalk last week, his game wasn't all that great in real life, but fantasy-wise, it was still pretty awesome. He scored over 20 DK points in a matchup with the Chiefs where they might have to take to the air a little bit more often. Uh, I could see Melvin Gordon actually being the play of this bunch. I think Hunt probably has the most upside. Ajayi might have the safest baseline, but Gordon is the one that can provide all the fantasy points if you need them. Yeah, I think I like Jay Ajayi the most. Um, it's the, just because of the situation. I, I think that they're not going to want Jay Cutler to throw the ball on the road. And we just saw Marshawn Lynch and company just run all through the Jets. And, you know, congratulations. The Jets actually still might be the best team in New York. That's just how bad the Giants are. But 
I I really like Jai this week. I like Melvin Gordon as well. I think those two are really just a toss up based on your personal preference. Um, you know, I just Kansas City this week feels like a really good letdown spot for me. So I'm going to have a lot of Melvin Gordon in tournaments, but I think I'm going to take the floor of Ajayi in cash games. Yeah, I, I can see that. The one thing about Ajayi is I, I just can't project his reception base to be as high as Gordon's. That would be the big differentiator with me, even though the matchup is better for Ajayi. Yeah, I, I definitely think Gordon has the higher PPR floor for sure. I, I just, with Ajayi, like if they score t- two touchdowns, you, you got to think he's getting one. So I, I, I get it. I think they're both awesome plays. I wouldn't talk anyone out of either one. So in cash games, would you pay up for like one of these guys, whether it be a Jai or whether it be Melvin Gordon or even Kareem Hunt, although he's a bit pricey. Do you think that's a way to start your running back core for cash? I think you should play. I think a Jai is a, a guy that you probably should play in cash this week. I mean, like everyone's going to play Ty Montgomery and everyone should be playing Ty Montgomery. So like that locks up one of your running back spots. So then the question just comes, do you want to pay up for a Jai? Or do you want to play a guy like, I mean, I, I love Christian McCaffrey and all, but I don't think you can even play him in cash. Like, He's a bit risky for cash, I think. I think he's just a little too risky. Like, I believe he's going to explode this week, but like, you have to at least see it on the field one time before you can roll him out in cash. Yeah, this is why, this, so, this is why we play the large tournament GPP, so we can have all the Christian McCaffrey we want. Yeah. I, I, unfortunately, Pat, I'm maxed out at 100%. You, you know, do you know a way I can get more than 100%? Um, no. No, I, I have no inside info on how you get more than 100%. All right. Then I guess I'll be capped at 100%. Um, I mean, I, if, if, if you talk to some of these guys, some of these running backs, they'll tell you they can give you 110%. I've heard that. Yeah, well, uh, that's good. I could really use that this week, Christian. If, you, if you're listening to the Pat Mayo experience, uh, I, I could definitely use you to go off this week. All right. Well, I, wh- I, I, why McCaffrey, though? What what, what brings you to McCaffrey as potentially being in a big spot against New Orleans. Obviously, the matchup is great, and now there's no Greg Olson in Carolina, but how many touches is it going to take for McCaffrey to earn tournament upside at his price at $6,100? Like, is he going to have to get 15 touches and break two big ones? I mean, I think he's going to get 20 to 25 touches in the spot. No Greg Olson. I think he's going to have even a bigger market share in the short passing game. I think that he they want him to be the guy. Like, he's out snapping Stuart something like 90 to 50 over those first two games this season. So I think they want him to be the guy. Like, you know, people, I mean, I was, if you want to read all my Christian McCaffrey takes, I got into a long fight about this yesterday on the Twitter machine the, at the CHDFS. But, like, to recap it shortly, like, the matchups for Christian McCaffrey left on the table two, two against New Orleans, two against Atlanta, the Patriots, the Jets, the Packers, and the Lions. Like, that's eight of his remaining 14 games. I just believe that he's going to run the ball better between between the tackles, outside the tackles, than he did against San Fran and Buffalo. Like, those are two respectable defenses this year. So, for me, I just believe in the talent of McCaffrey, and this is a good spot to buy low on him, maybe when people aren't as high on him because they haven't seen it yet. And I think that for these large-scale tournaments, I mean, I'm not going to be 100% in on him. I'm not quite at your level with this, but I think that he's now in a spot where everyone was so hyped on him, he's underperformed. Just the ownership isn't going to be there for him, and that really attracts me to both his price if I want to save some money and the potential upside that could go with it. Yeah, I don't know if I get to 100%, but that's because there's another PPR guy who's even cheaper that I, it's going to be tough for me to avoid. And Is Gillisley going to go overlooked this week, uh, Pat, because – like, it's a Patriots are a huge favorite at home. Like, normally everyone would start with Mike Gillisley, and I have, like, the or if it were with Garrett Blunt, it would be like, oh, it's a Blunt week. I haven't heard this it's a Gillisley week talk yet. Like, Pats don't have any wide receivers healthy. Like, is it out there and I'm missing it, or are people just kind of sleeping on him? I, I haven't heard it much really at all. It's just, it's so, I mean, I wouldn't go Gillisley in cash. Like, that just terrifies me way too much. But if we're talking about anyone on this board who could score four touchdowns this week, Gillisley's the guy. Like, but he also could present a big, like, two points for your line because he's not going to catch a pass. And if he doesn't score a touchdown, he's going to be kind of useless. I just worry, I shouldn't worry about the Pats and their offense where they're so banged up. Like, just watch magically everyone ends up playing on Sunday and it's not that big of a deal. But like, what if they're missing, what if Gronk is limited? What if they're missing Hogan and Amendola and Burkhead still banged up? Like, how good is this offense really going to be? Like, even if it's 30 carries for Gillisley, which if you guaranteed me 30 carries, I would take him. But against this defense, I mean, you know, Houston's no slouch defensively. Like, they can be run on. We saw that week one. But it might just be a 
one of these things where they spread guys out wide, throw to James White all the time or Deion Lewis, and then you're only banking on goal line carries for Gildersleeve. That, I guess, is sort of the case against him. I'll be using him marginally in tournaments, but I'm not super excited about it. I just think if those guys are out, right, his touchdown equity just goes up with each guy that's out. Because, like, if they're in the red zone, let's say there's no Gronk. Well, that's a huge red zone threat gone. You know, if Burkhead's out, then okay. Then, like, that's the only other guy who got red zone carries for the Patriots. So that ups Gillisley's upside. For each guy that's out or limited, it just ups Gillisley's touchdown upside. I, I like the spot for tournaments because I, I think people are just they're like, oh, he's not going to get all the workload. Well, he got a higher percentage of the snaps last week. Um, in a game that they were in front, and I think this is the best game flow for him yet on the season. So I think he's a guy that I'll have a bunch of tournament exposure to just because of the price. Like, if he scores two touchdowns, he's already at value. Before, if he gets, like, 10 yards and two touchdowns, like, that's 13 DK points. <laughs> you would take that. And obviously, if, he's gonna, if he scores two touchdowns, he'll have more than 10 yards rushing. Uh, Ty Montgomery is someone you said that everyone's going to play Ty Montgomery as they should. So you, this is just going to roll over from last week. I think people really like the spot last week against Atlanta, and they're kind of notoriously known for giving up a lot of uh, catches to running backs, and Ty Montgomery is used that way. Do you think that people are now going to go off of him because he was the chalk, he hit, and people are like, oh, that's great, and now he's not being quite as talked up as much this week as he was last week? I think it. I think it's gonna be worse this week. I think his ownership will be higher. Really? Like, I think. I think he'll be the highest owned player on the slate. Really? Yeah. Should, should he I, be? It depends on the status of Cobb and Nelson. Like if Cobb and Nelson are out, I think it's hard for him not to be the the best play on the board. If they're in, I think there's ways that he can potentially not score two touchdowns in tournaments, so you can fade. But. I mean, I think he's just too cheap. Like, I think if he was in the Jay Ajayi, Melvin Gordon, Kareem Hunt price tier, which he should be, I think then you could start making a real conversation about fading. But he's a thousand cheaper, and honestly, like, he should be just more expensive than he is. Uh, I know it's early in the week. It's only Wednesday. But in terms of fan share sports rankings right now, Jay Ajayi has the most tags of any player. Ty Montgomery is second. So he might be onto something uh, when it comes down to that. What about Devonta Freeman? He was overlooked last week. was great. He's probably going to be overlooked this week, and he'll probably be great again, won't he? Yeah, I like this spot for Freeman. Um, Julio Jones has a really tough cornerback matchup this week going up against Slay. So I, I like this spot for Freeman. Um, you know, on the road in a dome, I, I think Freeman, you know, we like this Atlanta offense on turf, and they're going to be on turf once again this week. So I think Freeman is definitely a guy for tournaments that I can like. And that's one of the reasons why I keep debating Le'Veon Bell. It's like, I like this guy, I like this guy, I like this guy, and I like this guy. And then there's a guy that's even cheaper that we haven't even gotten to that I like. So, you know, at some point you're going to – can't play everyone so someone that you like is going to have to get cut and it could be Le'Veon for me so in the 6,000 5,000 range we're going Lynch Delvin Cook at 59 CJ Anderson Mike Gillisley at 5,700 uh Tariq Cohen at 5,600 DeMarco Murray who's questionable right now with that hamstring problem James White Tevin Coleman Derek Henry Theo Riddick and Lamar Miller comes in at $5,000. And I want to start with Lamar Miller because I went back and looked at the game log from last year's playoff game. He ended up with four catches. I believe it was seven or eight targets in that game too. And people are kind of hyped on Dante Foreman right now. Do you think that Miller can become overlooked and become sort of a focal part of this passing game? If we talk about Gillisley being affected by the proper game script, by the Patriots being up by a bunch, I think that Miller could kind of conversely also be affected in a positive way by game flow if Deshaun Watson has to drop back and pass all the time underneath a crappy offensive line and just have to dump the ball off that could be a lot of Lamar Miller it could be I you don't seem sold <laughs> I hadn't even thought about Lamar Miller to be honest um yeah I guess if the Patriots take away DeAndre Hopkins which you would kind of expect that to be their game plan kind of like they did Michael Thomas last week it kind of then comes down to who's left they cut Jalen Strong so it's like Braxton Miller. Maybe maybe Bruce whatever, Ellington if he's healthy. Whatever third string tight end they're starting these days. And Lamar Miller. Yeah, I think you've got a solid case here, Pat. Like, I hadn't thought about Lamar Miller. Um, Patriots aren't exactly like this great defense. Um, I, think, I think last week was a lot more due to how bad the Saints offense just is. So I think that's this is an overreaction spot. I think you're right. Like, Lamar Miller at 5K definitely could be sneaky here. 
Um, the guy that I like in this range, and I know you're probably going to hate this take, I like Cohen. I like Cohen at $5,600. I don't think that people are going to be willing to pay up for that number. But with Howard banged up, like, I, I don't even really want Cohen running the ball whatsoever. But the fact that he has 21 targets through two games, the next closest running back is Melvin Gordon. He has 14. Uh, I just think that his floor in PPR is so high right now that if he just breaks a big one, he's going to return like 4x value super quickly. I like Cohen, but let me ask you, why wouldn't you just play Theo Riddick against Atlanta? Because uh, Theo Riddick should have been in the game on Monday night over and over and over. He was such an easy way. I, I know they beat the Giants, but every time he touched the ball and they threw to him, he was perfect. It just seems like they want to use Amir Abdullah for some reason and not Theo Riddick. And but, the, but Theo Riddick iced the clock at the end. Sure. Do you think that's how they're going to come out and start this game? Is Theo Riddick on the field the entire time? I don't think they are. Well, it's pass catching backs against Atlanta. We saw what Cohen did in week one, and we saw what Ty Montgomery did week two. We saw Theo, he's got 12 catches on the season, or 12 targets in the season. It's not like he's not being targeted out of the backfield a ton. It's a great matchup for him. It's a high total. Like, I love the spot for Theo. I, I think I would play him over Cohen, you know, if they were the same price, just because I think Cohen will get the ownership and the people will be worried about Abdullah. But I know Abdullah had one good run, but he was awful, Pat. Yeah, listen, listen, to there's, everything. there's a lot of bad running backs who continue to get carried. Jeremy Hill is still on a team and gets carries. Like, it, it's not about one being better than the other. It's, is one guy going to play more than the other? And if that's going to be the case, like, they're basically the same price, Cohen and Riddick. And I know that Cohen is going to be on the field. And the other running back in his backfield is injured right now. With Riddick, I agree with you that he's in a great spot. I just don't know if they're going to use him. And if that's going to be the case, I'll side with Cohen. I just I think that they're going to use Theo in this spot. Like we've seen in the past that they're perfectly willing to use Theo Riddick in good matchups. You know, if they're playing from behind, that just even promotes Theo Riddick even more. I just think that I think all roads end to Theo Riddick having a monster game in this spot. So I, I'm on board the Theo train. Um, I really like this spot for him a lot this week. And it just again, like my running back list keeps expanding. It's just, I, it's going to be tough for Le'Veon Bell to make a team. I can really see it at this point. It's going to be tough. Well, I think that kind of speaks to how everyone's going to feel this week about Le'Veon Bell, though. Like, what if I told you that Le'Veon Bell is going to have 4% ownership? Yeah, that's where you really have to just... Do you if just... I do that, I'm, I'm going to have to cut someone I like because if, I'm, if Bell's at 4%, like, I'm not going to play just 10% Le'Veon Bell. I'm either going like 30 or I'm going zero in tournaments. So it's just going to really just depend on maybe someone gets hurt. Maybe one of these matchups as I look deeper doesn't look as good and I can find a spot for Le'Veon, but it's going to be tough. I mean, the running back value this week and a lot of PPR guys are in good spots and are a little cheaper than maybe they should be. What about someone like Derrick Henry, who everyone's kind of, you know, he closed out the Jags last week, got all the carries, and DeMarco Murray was off on the sidelines dealing with a hamstring problem, a hamstring problem that he's still dealing with right now. But do you think he's going to be too popular in this spot for the potential for DeMarco Murray to come back and just get 50% of the snaps anyway? It depends if DeMarco Murray plays. Yeah, if, if he DeMarco does. Murray... Let's, okay, let's say he does play. Let's, let's go with that scenario first. Oh, you can't play Henry if Mark Murray's in. I just think there's too many better options, whether it be Cohen, Gillisley, Riddick, Lamar Miller, as you brought up. I, I don't think you could play Henry realistically if, if Murray's active. Okay, so let's say DeMarco Murray is out. How does that bump up Derrick Henry? I think he moves to the top of that, that tier because, you know, the Seattle run defense has been okay, but it's not like Carlos Hyde was terrible. Um, Carlos Hyde was had, good. Yeah, I don't know what it's with Carlos Hyde in Seattle. He's done this multiple times in Seattle where he looks good in that game. I, I just, you know, the Seattle offensive line is terrible. That defense has been playing a ton of a ton of time on the field. And, like, they're, I know they're super talented, but they're going to wear out if you just keep making them ask to play 40 minutes of defense a game. So I don't. I, I think the volume for Derrick Henry would make him, you know, the top guy in cash at that point. And then after that, I – for tournaments, he'd be in that mix. But, you know, there's so many options. You know, you're going to have to take a stand somewhere. Uh, I'm actually with you. If DeMarco Murray is inactive for this game and, and you know, we know that he's not going to be on the field, then Derrick Henry would become a cash lock for me as well. So you can check out the updated DK play, DKPlaybook.com, my updated DraftKings cheat sheet, and the positional rankings for season long, and I'll adjust Henry up. But for right now, it looks like DeMarco Murray is going to be on the field. And in that sense, I will actually go 100% fade on Derrick Henry just because I think 
that he'll end up being too popular for a spot that I don't love. On the other side of the ball, people are talking up Chris Carson. He's a very good price this week, although I don't love him for the DraftKings format because it's full point PPR, and I just don't think he's going to catch a lot of balls. Yeah, I'm with you. I like Chris Carson. I don't know if I like this spot a whole lot. Seattle offensive line, bad. Tennessee's defense looked really good last week. I know it was the Jaguars, but the Seattle offensive line was giving up a ton of pressure to the 49ers defense. So I I really don't think you can go Carson this week. I think you got to wait one more. Um, so for the rest of these guys down the list, whether we're talking about Abdullah or Jonathan Stewart or P. Ryan or Chris Thompson or even Jakiz Rogers, you know, your boy, Mark Ingram. I mean, he's everyone's boy besides mine, but he's on that list too. Frank Gore, Duke Johnson, uh, Isaiah Crowell. These are just names that keep popping up. Is there anyone that you prefer from down here? Because I actually really like Chris Thompson, and I know people are going to look and be like, oh, P. Ryan ended up with 21 carries. Oh, Rob Kelly might be back. But the way that this game flow, I expect it to go, with the Raiders favored on the road and the highest game total of the week right now at 54.5, I just think Washington's going to have to throw a ton. If they're going to throw a ton, Thompson's going to be on the field. I'm with you. I just I got that situation so wrong last week against the Rams. I thought the – I thought the Redskins were going to have to throw the ball all over the field, and the Rams just gave up 300 yards rushing. I still don't understand how that quite happened, but I'm with you on Thompson. I just don't know. Like, is he be- is he that much better of a player than Miller, Riddick, and even like Cohen? No, he's not that much better. He's not a better play than those guys. He's just cheaper. I guess the comparison I was ma- I want to make is Chris Thompson a better play than Darren Sproles at 3900. Oh, yeah, for sure. I just don't really see a whole lot of need to go this far. I feel like you're just taking on a lot of risk as soon as you get this low. I guess maybe other than Shane Vereen. I feel like you're taking a ton of risk for what is limited upside in most of these situations. I mean, the, the pricing is a bit tighter this week, uh, kind of like last week as opposed to week one. But do you think Vereen would be a viable cash play if you were just trying to save money? I... You would have to hear some negative words about Paul Perkins this week for me to kind of consider that. Are, are there any positive words about Paul Perkins? Apparently, uh, the Giants still like him for reasons I don't understand. Well, so, and so sadly, that's all that matters. So so far today, I've heard that they like Paul Perkins, but also they're going to give Orleans Darkwa more carries to cut into Perkins. Like I, I can't trust anything that's being said right now about like every day it changes what's coming out of camp. Which, as it should, if you were a coach, you'd want to give as much misinformation as possible. But like I don't want to buy into this at all. Vereen, they're going to be down in this game. Their offensive line stinks. So why wouldn't Vereen be on the field? Yeah, I don't know. I, I'm with you. And then one more guy, too, um, if you're looking for a GPP dart throw, Gio Bernard, if you think that they're behind against the Packers, he should see more snaps and get more passes out of the backfield. Um, last guy I want to talk about is a pure sort of pivot play at the position. I know we've kind of run out of running backs that we're going to use, but Delvin Cook looked okay against the Steelers. Um, I'm not really sure how good the Bucks' defense is. Yeah, they, they beat up on the Bears. Congratulations. Um, I guess this more, or less, more so probably depends if Sam Bradford plays or not. We don't know that right now. But even if Keenum plays, like, can he do enough by himself to earn value at this price? Because he's going to get all the volume. That's huge. That's usually something that we really like to see in a running back, and no one's playing Cook this week. I don't see it. I, there's just too many talented guys around him that are, don't have question marks like that. And then Tampa looked really good last week. I, I know they're going on the road now, but I think there's too many questions for – he also has to beat all these other guys around him to make it worth it. I, I just don't really see a road to Dalvin Cook winning me a tournament this week. Fair enough. Wide receivers, we go to the top. And, hey, another stealer, Antonio – oh, no, it's Julio Jones this week, 9300 bucks. I had him cut off my list. Antonio Brown, 99000 Beckham is 86, A.J. Green 81, Jordy Nelson, who may or may not play, is $7,800, Mike Evans 75, Crabtree 74, Cook 73, Keenan Allen 72, and Amari Cooper $7,100. I love A.J. Green in this spot. I think he's a bit overpriced at $8,100. I've been saying this all week. I like that he came out and just basically scolded the team for not throwing him the ball more. Usually when elite superstar receivers do that, they get fed the next week. This is a perfect game script for him with them expected to be down by a ton, having to throw, new coordinator, make your superstar happy. Everyone's kind of out on him. I hope this narrative doesn't build up throughout the week and he ends up becoming a popular play, but I don't think that people are going to pay $8,100 for AJ Green. I'm not using him in cash, but for tournaments, I'm all over him. The hype train has already started, Pat. Damn it! 
It's already started. I just came back from doing a show where uh, everyone, all three of us, loved AJ Green, and I was just like, all right, well, maybe it's just us. And then we get to the wide receivers, and I'm like, all right, well, maybe Pat will talk about someone other than AJ Green. And then you just talk about AJ Green. Now, how how many people out there listen to us None. after looking at those box scores? Now, that's a different story. I, that's the question that I'm not, you know, well, how much is the recency bias going to affect people? Because there's massive recency bias here. This offense has been terrible. They were on a national TV game. I guess we can call those Thursday games national TV games, right? Yeah. They're not worthy of that distinction, but they get it. Let's go with that. And there they saw they couldn't score a touchdown or even move the ball at all. But this spot for this is the perfect bounce back spot for them. Like the Packers defense is not very good. I'm with you. I expect AJ Green to be fed with targets. He's my number one wide receiver on the week. I love everything about this spot for AJ Green. I just hope that that the Cincinnati Bengals over the bye learned how, or the mini bye, I guess, learned how to throw him the ball. I th- I would imagine that they would, or even if they don't, they just kind of do the old Kelvin Johnson trick where it's just like, none of the other receivers exist. We're just going to toss it up to you, AJ, and you make the best of it. And I'm okay with that scenario. I think that can really work out from a fantasy perspective. But in terms of your recency bias, I'll just kind of take it from the sample that I've got so far where I've been calling AJ Green sort of the best buy low in season long right now. And people keep asking my question, me questions like, do I trade this guy for AJ Green or that guy for AJ Green? And I'll be like, yeah, you trade it. And the response is always, even with Dalton playing so poorly, like people don't want to buy in like people are really hesitant I think that goes a lot further than us being like hey AJ Green's a good play I think the box score recency bias does it I hope so I really do Pat I've been targeting AJ Green in any format I've been able to acquire so far I he's my I think he's my number three overall player on the week like straight point per dollar and straight raw points. I, I love AJ Green this week. I really do. I have no complaints about him. And if he burns me, he burns me. But I'll go down with that ship. Yeah, it's a ship I'm willing to go down with as well. What about the other top guys? Julio, Brown, Beckham. Are you going to be using those guys? Do you have a preference at all? If I was to use one, it would be Antonio. Um, Odell is just too limited. I, I kind of need to see a complete game from him at this point. Julio draws a really tough cornerback matchup in Slay. And even if some for some unforeseen reason that he doesn't shadow. Um, for me, it's a situation where Diggs on the other side has been dramatically improved from last year. So uh, I, I love me some Diggs. So I, I think he's been a very, very, very good corner this year through two weeks. So uh, there's just no way for, I'm playing Julio Jones really in any format this week. All right. Uh, so below that, do you have any interest in any of the other top guys? Like, is this finally a Cooks rebound spot now that everyone is injured? <sighs> I don't like. I don't really like the spot for Cooks. No, I, I think I think Crabtree is interesting. Um, I would expect Xavier Rhodes to shadow Evans, which makes this a tough place to play Evans. So I, I really think it's kind of just Crabtree, Keenan Allen. It always has PPR upside. Um, I, you know, he's just super talented. It's tough to just ignore him. Uh, so he's a guy I like a fair amount. Amari Cooper. You know, like he got the red zone targets in Week One and just dropped them all. And they went right back to Crabtree in week two. So I think I prefer Crabtree over Cooper, but uh, that's kind of my take on the situation. All right, so you have, like, your Michael Thomas is the world. He's kind of like A.J. Green in a sense. Like, it's funny with A.J. Green. You're like, A.J. Green has been destroying me through two weeks. He's been so bad. I think he's at seven points, like standard fantasy points <laughs> each of the first two games. I mean, he's not Jordan Howard out there. It's not the end of the world. Michael Thomas has been kind of the same way. They haven't used him in the same way, and he has been getting the volume and the high – you know, upside that we all expected from him. Is this a nice rebound spot for him against Carolina? Just because I don't know, it seems like New Orleans is going to be down and having to throw again. Yeah, this is the first spot where Michael Thomas isn't going to be in an obvious bad spot. You know, Xavier Rhodes week one was a bad spot. Week two, the Patriots just bracket covered him all day and he was just like never open. There was a safety over the top all day. Carolina really doesn't do that a whole lot with their defense. Um, so I, I think Thomas is a good rebound spot this week. Um, I mean, bluntly, like the Saints just have no other quality pass catching options on the team. They don't. Uh, all due respect to 10 Gid revenge game. Revenge he, game! He can certainly go catch a deep ball, but like there's only one guy right now who is like a consistent threat at all short, medium, and long on the field, and it's Michael Thomas. And They've just got to find ways to get him more involved this week. So I do think it's a good rebound spot. I think he's normally a guy that's going to be in the 8K range most of the year, and we're getting him at 7K in a pretty high total game. 
Uh, so the rest of the $6,000 area goes Golden Tate, Jarvis Landry, Calvin Benjamin, Tyreek Hill, Stefan Diggs. Again, we don't know who's playing quarterback, so that makes it a bit iffy. Doug Baldwin, Devontae Parker, DeAndre Hopkins, Chris Hogan is questionable, along with Randall Cobb who's dealing with that shoulder injury, although he is more expected to play than, let's say, Jordy Nelson, who's 50-50 at this point. From this range, I like Benjamin, I like Tyreek Hill, and I like Doug Baldwin. Uh, do you have anything against those three guys, or is there someone else that you like more? I think I'm done trusting the Seattle offensive line. I just, they're so bad, Pat. They can't block anybody. It's fine. I think I know, I know Logan Ryan's terrible in the slot. I, I watched him with the Patriots get burned time and time again. So I'll probably end up with some Dyke Baldwin as the week goes on. I'll go back and watch some Logan Ryan get burned clips to let me play him. So I, just, I think that's the one I have the most concern about. Tyreek Hill, you kind of know what he is. He's boom or bust. You're just going to have to play it a small percentage of him every week because he can go break a slate. But if he doesn't, like we saw last week, he's not going to be like this high four guy. Like if you think that, that's kind of the mirage. He, he's a boom bust guy. You know what you're going to get from him. So, you know, plan your exposure accordingly. Well, the, the one thing you can see with the Chargers and as it plays out through two weeks so far, Benny Fowler had the big game, then Jarvis Landry had the big game. I can see them using Tyreek Hill, much like the Dolphins used Jarvis Landry last week. So I think his floor this week is higher than it would be in other weeks. However, uh, he always has that big playability, like you said. I wouldn't use him in cash. He'd be a tournament-only play. And I think that Baldwin would be a tournament-only play for me as well. But I think that Calvin Benjamin in cash is something that you can rely on pretty well. I mean, it's always hard trusting Calvin Benjamin he's Calvin Benjamin and he can just do nothing or drop passes or just show up 80 pounds overweight week to week but this is the spot for him without Greg Olson I'm not trusting him in anything resort resorting a cash lineup there's no way no chance so you would play Thomas over Benjamin in cash Yes, I would. I don't think I would. I, I think the floor right now for Calvin Benjamin in this matchup against the pitiful Saints is the way you want to go. I think I would play Terrell Pryor first, who I know has just been god awful. But I think I would trust him more first. You would. I would trust. You would trust I, Terrell Pryor more. I really I think I would. A a any sort of reason why? Uh, hot, super high total game. Going to have to throw. The the Oakland corners are not good, and they really haven't had a passing offense yet that's able to go out there and throw outside the numbers. We'll talk about it when we get there. I have a lot of good. Um, maybe why the Oakland defense is slightly fraudulent uh, takes coming up. But, I, yeah, I, I think I, I just can't trust Calvin Benjamin at this point. Like, I just – I can't. I think he's – I think it's a great tournament play, but there is just no way that I could look at that in my cash lineup at 6,700 and go, this is the best use of alloc allocation of resources. Uh, when I finally – figure out how I'm going to configure my cash lineup. It's just, he's enough savings off the very top guys. And like I said, I'm not using AJ Green in cash. So he might be where I start and try to pile up with those guys uh, and try to find the safest floors from that range. I'll see when I end up finishing off the product. And again, you can check out the updated cheat sheet on dkplaybook.com for all the updated cash and tournament plays that I'm going to end up on this week for the Sunday slate. So in the $6,000 area, Demarius Thomas leads that list. Terrell Pryor's on there as well, like you mentioned. Then it's Elshon Jeffrey, Emmanuel Sanders, Martavis Bryant, Thielen, Adams, Amendola, T.Y. Hilton, Brennan Marshall, uh, Jamison Crowder's the, at 4,900 kind of bottoming out that list. If Nelson doesn't go, how popular are Cobb and Adams going to be this week? I'm pretty popular. I think Cobb will be more popular than Adams, and I think that's a huge mistake. Really? I, I see. I would go with Cobb over Adams. I don't trust Adams. Any, ever. Why? Because he, yeah, he was terrible so for five games as a rookie? Get over it. How Get about, over it, guys. How, 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 about the, how about the touchdown expectancy from last year is going to normalize as it has so far this season? Maybe he's just not that good. What do you mean? He got tackled at the half-inch line. Yeah, so it's starting to happen. Oh. Yeah, he had one. So he's got one touchdown through two games, and he got tackled at the half inch line. And one of those games was against the Seattle defense. You're calling that normalizing? Yeah, I am. I yeah. think that's a dramatic overreaction here. Like, do, do you think he's? Gonna, is, do you think that he's going to hit double digit touchdowns this year? Yes. See, I don't. I, I do. Like he, he's a. You know, when, when James Jones came back in 2015, when Rodgers trusts you in the red zone, he throws the ball to you in the red zone. He trusts Devontae Adams in the red zone. He'll get thrown the ball in the red zone. I, I think that people that are expecting all this Devontae Adams touchdown regression are going to be in for a rude awakening. Uh, I think that he would be my favorite play. Even if Jordy Nelson goes, if, even if Nelson goes, I think I would play Devontae Adams. Because I, I wouldn't be 
willing to be confident in Nelson's health. Um, I have loved Devontae Adams at 5,600 this week. Uh, if Sam Bradford plays and it's proven that he's healthy, I'd rather play Thielen. How could you possibly prove that he's healthy? He's got a knee injury that he's already torn like twice. Hey, listen, if he's practicing on Friday and then he's in there in warm-ups, he's going to be healthy enough to play. But we didn't even know that he, like, we didn't even know how he got hurt. Like, there's not even a play you can go back and look at week one. We don't even know how he got hurt. I, I think there's a ton of red flags with that injury. I, I really don't think you can trust, honestly, Sam Bradford the rest of the way. I, I mean, I don't know if I want to put all my trust in Sam Bradford, but if he's under center, I trust that he will throw to Adam Thielen for sure. Okay, and then he'll get hit once in the knee, and then he'll be out. Like, I just, I understand it. I think Devontae Adams is in the higher, the better offense, the offense that's going to run more plays. Um, yeah, maybe he's not the primary option, but maybe Thielen isn't either. He's kind of like a co-1A with Diggs. So, for me, it's Adam, Adams over Thielen this week in pretty much any scenario that could, out, could play out. Okay. I mean, I, I can be sold on Devonta Adams. I'm just not a true believer like you are, but uh, apparently you're all in. Would you use him in cash? He's definitely on the list, yeah. If, um, if Nelson is out, would you use him in cash? Yes. And if Nelson is in, you'd consider it? It's tough because Ty Montgomery is already taking a slot, so the question is just how much Packers do I want to play in cash? Well, at that uh, point, if you're using Adams and you're using Ty Montgomery, you might as well use Aaron Rodgers too. I can't, you kind of can't make that work in cash, and that's kind of where I just, I'm not a huge stacking cash guy. But there's a lot of targets to go around in this scenario, so I, I wouldn't hate it in this scenario. All right. So, um, so in this minus five thousand dollar area, like I mentioned, Jamison Crowder's right there. Corey. Cole. Can we talk about Pryor for a minute? Yeah, yeah. Let, give, give me your spiel on Pryor. I get the upside, but like they're not using him. <laughs> he just dropped a bunch of balls week one and, and cut, week two. They just ran all over the Rams. I'm not gonna like, you know, he had a tough matchup too in, in EJ Gaines who shadowed him. I. For me, I just think this is a really good bounce back spot against a poor Raiders secondary. Like what the Raiders did to Marcus Mariota in Week One was they made him throw to the right, and he's one one of the absolute worst quarterbacks throwing to the right. They shifted their coverage over to the left and made made Mariota throw to the right, and that's why he was so inefficient. Week Two, they played the Jets, and even McCown, by the way, had some passing success against this Raiders team. Curse caught two touchdowns, I believe. He had a monster game. So, you know, this is a talented offense for sure. Um, I think Crowder at 4,900 is the guy but that people are going to feel safer with. But Pryor has the red zone upside here to catch two touchdowns. He's a little too cheap. It's a high total game that I want to attack. So I think I'm going to go back to Terrell Pryor one more week because I'm not sure the Raiders' defense is good. I think it was kind of a product of forcing Mariota to throw to the right and facing the Jets. I'm with you on Oakland's defense being completely fraudulent. I think people work it up in their minds that Khalil Mack is so good, so that just makes their defense so good. But, again, it's not. Like, they have a terrible secondary. They have you know, limited pass rushing options after Mack to actually get to the quarterback and get sustained pressure over and over. And when you bring him in, I mean, there's a lot to do over the middle of the field. So I think Kirk Cousins is in a good spot here to have a decent passing game. I, I'm with you. I don't think the Oakland defense is good. I just don't know if I trust Pryor. Tournament-wise, sure, not sniffing my cash team. Oh, yeah. No, 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 no. Nowhere near a cash lineup, right. for sure. So, so the sub five thousand dollar area you mentioned, Cratter, he's forty nine hundred dollars. Then it goes down to Sterling Shepard, Galladay, Deshaun Jackson, Curse, who you just mentioned, Tyrell the Gazelle, he's down there. He's forty six hundred dollars. Sanu, Stills, Kendall Wright. Uh, I like Devin Funches quite a bit here, maybe as a deeper tournament play, and potentially even Russell Shepard in that offense as well, just to try to pick on the Saints, who with wide receivers are going to have more market share without Greg Olson around. And I guess the other guy who everyone is hyping up this week, and I'm kind of on board as well, it's Richard Higgins. He's only $4,000. He gets the pitiful Colts. Kaiser through two weeks. And I mean, you're a Notre Dame guy. You know all about Kaiser. Apparently he loves two things, tossing picks and only throwing to one guy. And right now that guy is Higgins. Yeah. I, I think the Higgins in cash is close to a lock at this point. Um, is that scary that to you? Yeah, but I just think you block and move on. Like, he just, you know, guy that when Kyder didn't have the start of the job at the start of training camp, he probably worked with Higgins a lot on that second team offense. And then when he got promoted, you know, probably didn't get as many reps with Higgins. But you saw he got promoted on Saturday and he went right to him. Uh, so it, there probably was some chemistry there in, in camp as well they wanted to see um, in practices. So I, I think it's a little safer than people want to lead on. But I wouldn't fade Kenny Britton tournaments. Like, you're not going to get Kenny Britt any lower than this. And I know he's looked terrible. 
I know they threatened his starting job more than once. So I'm not saying to play a huge amount of Kenny Britt, but we've seen what Kenny Britt can do. Like, if they're going deep. And without Corey Coleman, I could see Kenny Britt putting up a huge number in tournaments this week. I really could. Um, so that's a guy I will have some tournament exposure to. Is Jermaine Curse safe in cash? Because that's a question I've been getting a lot this week. I don't think he is. Safe? No. Do I feel okay with it? Probably. Like, he's just... I mean, he was late to the scene, and he got seven targets in week one and five in week two, and he's been maximizing the targets. And I think he could get more. I, you know, it's not like two. It's not like Xavier Howard is gonna is gonna shadow Curse in the slot too. So like, you know, if you if Robbie Anderson gets Xavier Howard, who I respect a ton, um, like it even opens up more opportunities for Curse. So I feel pretty good about Curse this week. Maybe as good as I'll feel about a Jets player all year, which really isn't saying a whole lot. But I, I do feel pretty okay with him this week if you needed him over Higgins for some reason. Yeah, see, I, I would just lean Higgins in all spots. I'm just thinking if people want to get tricky and play them both and then pay up everywhere else, that would be a way to save money. I think in tournaments you can fade Higgins. I think he's firmly fadeable in tournaments. Because, sure, well, okay. yeah, I think he's a cash play most definitely because of the floor that he is projected to provide in terms of targets and the, the sort of receptions that he ends up with. They're sort of lower A dot plays that don't result in a bunch of yardage, but he gets out enough volume through the catches you know, to get 90 yards or so. Like I don't know if he's going 9 for 100 or anything like that, but he could be 6 for 67, and that's good enough at his price. Yeah, I'm with you there for sure. And with Curse, the return of Austin Safarian Jenkins to see how he's incorporated into this offense, which doesn't seem like should make that big of a difference, but we talked about touchdown equity when it came to Mike Gillisley early. I think a return of ASJ would hurt the touchdown equity of Jermaine Curse in the red zone. Also, ASJ is also just not very good. Hey, he's past his problems now, okay? I mean, I guess there's definitely. I, I guess I would agree the touchdown upside's lowered, but I, I like I, I feel pretty good that Curse is going to get a boost in targets this week. Like I think he'll get to the eight or nine target number, and at forty six hundred, that's just going to appeal to me no matter what the touchdown equity situation is. Uh, is there anyone else from this range or below that you think deserves any sort of mention for tournaments or GP or cash games? Uh, let's see. I think there was there was just going through here. There was one guy I wanted to bring up. Oh, you mentioned Bruce Ellington earlier. Yeah. If he plays, I think at 3,300, you know, you expect the Patriots to bracket off DeAndre Hopkins. Ellington could be in the line for uh, a few more targets this week. Yeah, I, I would actually agree with you uh, quite a bit here that if Ellington does play, that he is a very sneaky play. Um, if he does play, I know that trusting him for a cash game lineup is probably a bit insane but let's say you were able to really if you went higgins and ellington and you were able to build a superstar team around that would that be worth it or is that too Not much or is that too much? too much it's just too much in cash it's just too much like I, I think at that point you're just getting yourself a little too cute like there's some good other wide receiver options we've talked about that i think you should just play in cash and then reserve bruce ellington for tournaments please um and another tournament play from down here just for the big play potential we haven't seen it yet and of course he got benched last week but hey new offensive coordinator hopefully the bengals can do something what about john ross at 3300 dollars? i mean if I, i've been sort of in the habit of playing these deep ball guys from these lower prices every single week just on a few teams to throw them at the bottom whether it be marquise good win or Robbie Anderson like last year it just worked out really well with Ted for the last two years it's worked out really well with Ted Ginn could John Ross be that type of player big guy would just play Ted Ginn first at 4100 in the revenge game who we kind of skipped over yeah I mean I have no trust in Ted Ginn but it, I guess you do play him in a spot or two don't you you have to have to you don't have to do anything it's my lineup siege I, 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 I'm, I'm talking to the listeners. I think if you're playing like 20 teams in that three entry max on DraftKings, like I think you have to play right. at least one ten good. All right, let's talk QBs and the top stacks of the week. Uh, the top 10 quarterbacks go Brady, Rogers, Breeze, Ryan, Carr, Cam Newton, Phillip Rivers, Russell Wilson, Ben Roethlisberger, Matt Stafford. Um, the thing that I'm looking for right away is Matt Stafford in cash at $6,200. This is the second highest game total of the week. Running the ball for the Lions you know, is on the uptick, but it is just as non-effective as it's been every other year that Matt Stafford has been there. So I really think that limits the amount of rushing touch 
touchdowns that kind of go their way, allowing Matt Stafford to pass more in the red zone. And Atlanta's going to keep him thrown. It's not going to be 21 attempts for 170 yards for Matt Stafford this week. He's going to be chucking it. And I think he can throw some touchdowns at home against Atlanta. And he's only $6,200. Like, can you talk me off of Matt Stafford? It would be to talk you on to Kirk Cousins for all the reasons we just talked about the Oakland defense being a total fraud. I just think that Stafford's better, and I would rather go with the better guy around the similar price. That's fair. I think the Washington game has the higher total. I I think that Washington is going to definitely be more likely to be in a shootout. I don't think the Washington defense has a prayer of stock with the Raiders offense. Is this, it's really hard for me to picture a game flow where Kirk Cousins isn't throwing the ball 40 times. I could see a situation where Matt Stafford and the Detroit Lions just kind of run over Atlanta coming off of that emotional game on Sunday night opening the new building. I can see a road in which Matt Stafford fails. Really tough for me to see a road where Cousins fails, but they're both great options. I wouldn't talk you out of one if you liked one more than the other. Yeah, I, I think it just comes down to, in my head, with the way that I've seen Matt Stafford play you know, so far this year, and basically since Jim Bob Cooter took over as offensive coordinator. That's our weekly work in Jim Bob Cooter reference. But he's looked good. Like, he doesn't have these dud games. I, Kirk Cousins... I don't even know if he is good. I get that the volume is going to be there and he's in a great spot, but if he just threw eight picks, I wouldn't be stunned either. I I just, for me, it comes down to who's more likely to score to throw three passing touchdowns. And for me, that's cousins. I, you know, like I think, I think if Detroit wins this game, it could be like 27 to 21. And, you know, I, I just feel better about cousins throwing from, I, I, for me, it's cousins over Stafford. Um, I don't trust Matt Stafford. I don't trust that offensive line. It didn't look great last week. Uh, maybe it comes down to whether Vic Beasley plays or not, but um, it's close for me. I I, I think I lean Cousins. Uh, if we do stack some of these guys, like who are you? I mean, I guess the – do you put Jordan Reed in a stack with Kirk Cousins, or, and could you use Chris Thompson in that stack as well if you were going to do it? Yeah, I think you can use any of those four guys. I think you can use Crowder, Pryor, Reed, or Thompson in, in a stack, or even use two of them. Um, if you're really stacking up the game. And if you were to use Matt Stafford, would you do Stafford, Tate, Jones, Stafford, Jones, Galladay, that kind of thing, and maybe throw an Ebron or Riddick into that mix too? It would be a Stafford, Riddick on all my stacks for me. And then I would tack on a wide receiver from there, probably Tate. Um, um, so, I mean, those are the two sort of value guys that we're really looking at for this week. Of the top end guys, uh, Cam Newton, I feel like, is in a very good spot at a very cheap price at 6600 And I've already talked about I like Benjamin. You could use Funches kind of thing. You can kind of run out that stack. But could you just play Cam Newton by himself and maybe be okay with it? Can he throw the football? Yeah, I think he can throw it really high. Yeah, he can throw it over people's heads. Yeah. I just – boy – I think if I'm playing Cam Newton, I'm stacking him. And I can't decide. I, I want to love Cam Newton. But every time I go back and watch one of those games, it's just overthrow after overthrow. And you just have to wonder how healthy that shoulder is. Do you, but isn't it one of these things where it just – like even if he's going to be, let's say, you know, out of the 16 games, 12 of them, he doesn't look good. Isn't it worth it to use him at least in a few lineups for those four games that he just goes bonkers? Yeah, I, I agree with you. I, I just – it's really tough to be like, all right, Cam Newton, you're going to be one of my three main guys this week or four main guys. Just tough to trust him at this point. But, you know, when you also look above, it's not like there's all these top options in great spots. So that, that kind of helps your case with Cam a little bit. Uh, I think Rodgers is in a pretty good spot. He's just expensive. That's the one that of the four. Like, I won't play. I don't think you can play Brady, Breeze, or Ryan really in tournaments this week. I'm just, I don't really see a ton of upside there. I mean, I guess Breeze could go off on the road, but if he goes off, so too probably does Cam Newton for less, and he's got more rushing ability. So I just think Cam will just outscore Breeze a lot if that game shoots out. So I think I would rather play Cam in those if you're projecting a shootout. So for me, it's kind of Rodgers from that top tier. Um, and for all the reasons we talked about, you know, Ty Montgomery, Devontae Adams, they really just can't run the ball consistently. So it's just going to be tons of throwing, really. Uh, would you throw Jordy Nelson into a stack with Rodgers and potentially Adams if he ends up playing? I don't see a world in which I play Jordy Nelson this week. I just don't know if I can trust that that injury. He, his, he's also a guy that just – I think I would just roll out Devontae Adams first. I really would. 
Um, what about Derek Carr? We've talked a lot about Cousins in that game, and obviously Oakland is the favorite on the road, but you've talked about how their defense can't really hold up. So this might be a situation where he has to keep passing, passing, passing the entire game. Like, can you just kind of break it down and hope Lynch doesn't get any touchdowns or Jalen Richard doesn't get any touchdowns or the defense doesn't score and just go Cooper, Crabtree, Carr, and feel really good about it? Yeah, you could, um, for sure. Um, in these situations, when it just comes down to like limiting my quarterback player pool, I ask, like, what does this quarterback offer me that other guys in my player pool don't? So it's like, what does Carr offer me that Rodgers doesn't? Not a whole lot. What does Carr offer me that Cam Newton doesn't? I guess some consistency, but Cam Newton has the rushing upside. And, you know, his Cousins for 700 less is in the same kind of spot. So it, it, it's going to be tough for me to kind of get to Carr in my core. Um, but I don't hate the idea. All right, so below Cousins in that 5000 down to like the upper $4,000 area, is there any other quarterback you would consider? Because I kind of like Carson Wentz. Yeah, that's the one guy I would consider is Carson Wentz. Um, the just Giants team has just been terrible. And they, Phillies, or the Eagles have just shown no ability to run the football. So I, I think Wentz is a pretty safe option at 5900 But the problem is who do you stack them with, Ertz? Yeah, I, I, kind of listen, I, I think that Ertz is an elite play this week, and he's probably like the elite play of all tight ends every week at this point. And he went down in Bryce. Yeah, and he's facing the Giants, and, so and, I'm with you. And the Giants have struggled against tight ends so far this season, so it really works out well for Ertz. And he hasn't disappointed as the chalk so far this season, which is unusual for him, to say the least. Last guy will throw $5,000 if you just wanted to play him by himself or play him with Richard Higgins. I could see Kaiser scoring fantasy points against the Colts. You say no, why not? I just don't think it. Just play Higgins at that point. Like, if I'm stacking Kaiser, it's with Kenny Britt for the big play upside. Triple stack? Oh, it's the Browns. Let's not get carried away here. Hey, they're favorites on the road, all right? Like, I just. Favorites on the road. <laughs> What a world we live in. All right, let's switch to tight ends. Gronk comes in at number one. He's 6,800. He's still questionable with the groin, but it does look like he's going to play, although he might be limited. Uh, if he was 6,900, I'd be all in. But he's not this time around, so I don't know if he's going to be as amped up to score touchdowns again. Travis Kelsey, 6,000. Reed, 54. Ertz, 5,000. Jimmy Graham, 46. Walker, 4,000. Uh, sorry, 4,400. Kyle Rudolph, 42. Kobe Fleener, 41. And Martellus Bennett, 4,000. Those are your sort of upper crop of tight ends right now. Uh, I really like Zach Ertz and Cash. If you can afford him, I think $5,000 is a very fair price. Right now, he's first in yardage at tight ends. He's second in reception, second in targets, and going up against the Giants, which on paper is a very good matchup for him. I like it. Although, I think my favorite player of the week, like he was last week, and it turned out to be all right, Travis Kelsey should just eat up this San, Di or San Diego, Los Angeles Chargers defense, just with the routes that he runs, where he runs on the field. like They have no answer for anything over the middle. That's where he's going to be. He's going to be running primarily out of the slot, and I just don't know who covers him. Yeah, I, I don't really have a good answer for that either. I think Kelsey and Ertz are your mega chalk of the week. But, should, um, but even though they're the mega chalk, does that mean you shouldn't play them? Because I'm going to play them either way. I'm probably realistically playing Ertz either way, and Kelsey... I really, it's so hard for me to trust Alex Smith, but I'll probably have Kelsey this week. Uh, Let's just hope that he hasn't burned me this week. Well, the big thing with the chalk when it applies to Kelsey, we, we've been talking about how, hey, you don't need to pay down that much at running back. You can take all these mid-tier guys, but those guys add up. There's situations that occur where if it's the difference between tra taking Travis Kelsey or paying down for, let's say, like Kobe Fleener or someone else at tight end, I feel like people will make that move before they pay down at running back or pay down at receiver, and that might end up helping Travis Travis Kelsey's overall ownership from not getting too high. I think people will pay down at running back first. I think people are going to really? feel much more comfortable about those guys in the seven K tier and the six K tier than they will. Like, cause once you get below Kobe Fleener, the tight end world kind of turns into a graveyard very fast. Um, there's some interesting punts here, but I think if you're asking people to choose between like, even a guy they probably don't trust, it's like Kelsey and Christian McCaffrey or, um, Cameron Brait and Le'Veon Bell. I think people are going to feel much better about the Kelsey side. Okay, well, here's the thing. I know it's still very early in the week, but I found that FanshareSports.com, everyone can go sign up there for free right now to check out who the industry is talking about and getting hyped up. Do you know who number one at tight end this week is on that list? Zach Gertz. Jack Doyle, $3,600. 
What? Yep. Like, I like Jack Doyle as a sleeper and all, but number one? Come on. Hey, but, it, but I'm saying, people are people will pay down at tight end. So Doyle is number one, then it's Zach Ertz, then it's Jared Cook at 3,100, then it's Ed Dixon at 2,700. Ed Dixon can't catch. I didn't even know Ed Dixon was in the NFL, I swear. I had no idea he was in the league. What he, team is he even on? He plays for the P's. He's now the starting tight end on the Panthers. He drops at least two. Oh, years. come on, people. Why? Why would you play Ed Dixon? Oh, for goodness sake. So this is why I'm saying, like, Kelsey's not even on the top 10 of mentioned tight ends right now. I I think he's going to go under-owned again, and if that's the case, you got to use Travis Kelsey. I hope you're right, Pat. <laughs> I really hope you're I right. I mean, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do the ownership and chalk show on Friday when we get more and more information. We have a more accurate view of who's getting talked up. Now that you and I have both talked up Travis Kelsey, he's now going to be on this list because we're two people that are included in this list. So that's going to up his percentage. And if people watch this, so you know what the pile on effect is like. It just takes one or two people to talk about one guy that everyone's on him. Maybe that does affect things. But right now, I think that there are enough names popping at the top of this list, whether it be Doyle, Cook, or even Ed Dixon, that's going to kill the ownership of all the top guys that aren't Ertz. I can't believe those are the value tight ends people are picking. I had literally a list of four, and none of those guys made it other than Doyle. All right. That's... All right. Who, who are your value tight ends then? I would play Austin Hooper first against Detroit. I, uh, I, we, we... I would only play him in tournaments. Yeah, absolutely. I wouldn't play him in cash games. Absolutely not. I think Ertz is a lock for cash. I think you just play Ertz. You, you find the money. Uh, but... We know Detroit's not necessarily, doesn't necessarily have these great linebackers, and Hooper, I think, is a, is a red zone threat um, for sure. Uh, I don't mind Eric Ebron uh, against Atlanta for 3,300. I think that's a little too cheap. Um, I think Evan Ingram at 3,200 against Philly is too cheap if they somehow get to the red zone, which, you know, maybe not. <laughs> but the guy I really want to spend time on is Cameron Brake at 3K. Um, this is a really good funnel spot for him. So you're going to have Deshaun Jackson is the deep threat. You have Evans being shadowed by Xavier Rhodes. If they're looking for intermediate routes, I think Cameron Brate's the guy. Week one, the game flow got completely out of whack really early on because Mike Glennon is terrible. And, and Brate just really wasn't used that much. But even during the game, the commentators were mentioning about how Cameron Brate's going to have a huge role in this offense and the game flow had just gotten away from him. He's 3K. I, I like him a lot for tournaments. I think that that's the I would play him over Ed Dixon and like I, I don't even know who else you mentioned. Jared Cook. Like I, first of all, I think Jared Cook's gonna be doing a lot of blocking this week, a lot of blocking. So I I, I understand he's caught nine balls, but I, I would definitely have no interest in Jared Cook. I would take Cameron Bray first. If you had to pay down, you could not afford Zach Ertz in cash games. Would you go to Eric Ebron or would you go to Jack Doyle? I would probably go to Jack Doyle. I think I would too. And I think that a lot of people will pay down a tight end in cash games as a way to save money. Man, Zach Ertz in cash, though. Like, I, I'm with you. Good. I am going to play Zach Ertz in cash. That's me. Zach, not not oh, everyone man. is me. <laughs> God, Zach Ertz. We know that we know the Zach Ertz bust week is coming, right? Like anyone who's played DFS before, and if you haven't, welcome to DFS. It's awesome. But. <laughs> One of the things you should know is Zach Ertz will burn us at some point. Oh, I, I, I know it's coming, but I'm going to keep riding this out while it's still hot. I'm with you, but I just want everyone to know, like, it, it will happen. <laughs> like, Zach Ertz chalk bust week will happen. Defenses, to close this out. The Patriots are the most expensive defense going up against Houston, and then we get to the Dolphins playing the Jets at $3,700. Then you have the Broncos, Seahawks, Steelers, Packers, Vikings, Colts, Buccaneers, and then the Giants, the mighty Giants at $3,100. For me, weirdly enough, I went this way week one and it worked out. Uh, my week two big cash kind of cheaper defense with the Chargers did not work out whatsoever. But I'm going back to the Eagles at $3,000 against the Giants. Ninth highest adjusted sack rate. We know what we've seen from the Giants so far. A, they just don't score points. and so That's good news. The offensive line is trash and Eli's going to turn the ball over and I feel like this Eagles defense will not great is ultra opportunistic and Eli's thrown the ball 70 times through two weeks if you're going to tell me that Eli's going to throw the ball 35 times I will take the other defense against him also should note the Giants special teams is historically horrific and Eagles uh, special teams is very good so I think you have a higher probability than normal of a uh, punt return or a kick return touchdown oh, as well d double stack Darren Sproles Eagles D let's go yeah, Sproles has been getting a lot of snaps. I think that actually is very viable this week. If you're trying to get cute in tournaments, I, I wouldn't blame that at all. Um, 
I don't really, really like any of those expensive defenses. Like, the first one on the board for me, and this one, like, all right, I, I get people are going to boo and hiss, but hang in there. The Colts. For all the things we've said about Deshaun Kaiser, he's been getting sacked a ton. He's been a rookie. He's thrown bad balls. I think the Colts at 3,200 at home are in play <laughs> for tournaments. I, I think if I – out of the top defenses, it's, it's such a bummer Baltimore's not on the board this week because I would just be using Baltimore's D and Buck Allen and being on my way. Uh, and either, maybe even just paying down for Ben Watson. Uh, that just would have been terrific. But, of course, we don't get that game for the Millionaire Maker slate. I like the Broncos D on the road to the Bills. I think the Bills offense is absolute no, Pat, garbage. Pat, don't take – no, don't take the West Coast to East Coast 1 o'clock defense. Don't do that. It's not, it's not West Coast. It's mountain time. It's the West Coast. It's not the way you do really. Listen, I'm no geography major, and I'm not from America, although I may have a better sense than most Americans about geography in general. I don't even know if they teach that to you guys. But no, not on the coast, by the way. Not even in the same time zone. Not even in the same time zone. The idea of the West, it's it's a team flying in for a morning kickoff. So, okay, the kickoff is at 11 a.m. Mountain Time instead of 10 10 a.m. Pacific. Like, the, the, the time zone change is still very real. Have you seen from... this Bills offense? It is pitiful. It's not that bad. It's bad. No, it's really bad. It's not that bad. It's... I, I well, feel okay, I what's, 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 what's not that the Jets offense might be better than the Bills offense? Oh, that's a low. Oh, and the Bills are fine. Like, they're still working through. Tyrod Taylor had the concussion, and they had players coming in and out of training camp. Like, September... Football now is kind of just like an extension of training camp. Well, I try we're, not we're take... still in September, so this is still viable. I just you, you look at this game and Denver is a three point favorite on the road, and this. I mean, how many times have we seen the Packers going to Buffalo as a three point favorite and just get cleaned their clock cleaned? I, I, there's no chance in the world that I would play the Denver defense in any format this week. No chance, especially at that 3600 price tag. I would play teams like the Titans first up against that terrible Seattle offensive line. I would play the Eagles, as mentioned. I mentioned the Colts. I would also, I would even take a shot on the Bears first before I played uh, the Broncos this week. I just, no way. No chance. I, I'm somewhat with you. This could be a potential trap spot in terms of the spread. The Bills could win this game, but the Bills aren't winning this game 37-3. to If the Bills win, it's going to be like 9-6 or something stupid. And that way, the defense can still be really good. Just where Tyrod runs the ball so much, he just allows himself to be sacked so often. And you know they're getting through. I, I would, I just, I don't, I'm not playing a road defense at 3,600 in that kind of situation. It's just, it's too much risk for very little reward. How about the Packers, D? I trust in, I trust Andy Dalton. He will throw the ball well. He will do it. I promise. I hope. I, I don't know Please. if these. I, I don't know if these visualization tactics work or not, Siege. Oh, I really hope so. I, I, I visualize an a, AJ Green catching three touchdowns. I'm just trying to make this true. I can't play the Packers. They're gonna be. Did, they're gonna be facing a lot of passes towards them, and if they can just turn one of them into a score, which they can do, we'll see what happens. I like the Eagles the best out of all the defenses, though. That's me. Yeah, I think for me it's Eagles, Titans, Colts. And I like Eagles. Oh, and- Vikings, too. I mentioned, I forgot the Vikings. In case Tampa just isn't good and Winston can, Winston could just get burned. Like, we have only a one-week sample size against the Bears. People will just assume that. Vikings defense could be in play. I like it more if Bradford goes, though. All right, cool. CJ Kaltenbach. You can follow him on Twitter at the Siege DFS and check him out at Roto Grinders and on the Morning Grind. Any, anywhere else where we should be watching you? No, that's everywhere. And on the Pat Mayo Experience, obviously. Yeah, hopefully you, hopefully uh, people like it and I come back. <laughs> See, Siege, how often do you do things and people love it? That's a very fair point. So you'll definitely be back then. I mean, if there's one thing that my guests are known for, it's be being antagonized by the people. <laughs> That's a fair point. Yeah, uh, between Tim Anderson and me, you've got that market pretty well cornered there. Yeah, I'm, try- I'm trying to build a collection of, of guests. It just makes me look better in terms of, like, I'm not super likable in general, but, you know, if I, you, you got crazy takes and Tim's got crazy takes, just by, you know, standing next to you, I look a lot better, so it's fantastic. My stupid takes don't seem as stupid anymore. It's a smart play, Pat. It's a smart play. We That's may how have, you got your own show. Yeah, we might have to get you and Cust on the line in the the one time that he someone just agrees with him on all of his chain food takes. Oh man, that would be an epic show. 
Well, we might have to get, arrange that for some point. Anyway, thanks a lot for being on the live, Siege. Uh, you bet, Pat. All right, I'm Pat Mayo. You can follow me at the PME on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. You can also follow the Pat Mayo Experience audio version on Google Play, on iTunes, on Stitcher, and audio. And for the video version, go to YouTube and check out the DraftKings page. And there's its own playlist, the Pat Mayo Experience, spelled properly and everything. Super easy to find. Plus, you can find all of my info up on DKPlaybook.com. And it will all be updated all the way up until Sunday. So no need to worry about that. Check back twice. Give me double the clicks. Great news. I'm Pat Mayo. Good luck this week. I'll see you next time.